Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our session. Uh, the session is really looking at the work of People for the People, a grassroots advocacy group um, of 150 plus people that came together creating information products uh, to empower people to be civic minded going into 2020 election, the presidential election. Um, today, we're going to be covering a lot of different things. And let me share my screen now so you guys can kind of see the agenda that we have for you. All right, so we're going to be talking about our team's mission and organization just to kind of set some context around um, who is people for the people uh, and what were our aims and our goals. We're also going to show you guys a little bit of design thinking, uh, talking about that design knowledge and foundation of the work, as well as showcasing some applications and then going into how we're telling stories and communicating the work that we do um, through hub and story maps. So going into this, um, the mission and team itself, uh, as I mentioned, is a GIS community focused um, on educating and empowering individuals to engage with civic issues. Uh, the P4TP team um, is made up of volunteers from diverse backgrounds, ethnicities, um, thought process, and even political party affiliation. So going into this, we really wanted to make sure that uh, we remained as neutral as possible. Obviously, that was a very hard uh, goal to accomplish, but through putting people first in all that we were doing and telling the stories of communities, we allowed for that to drive our decision on what information to include in the type of approach that we would take um, in the stories that we're presenting. Our group, as I mentioned, is a made up of 150 plus individuals answering that call to action made by Black Girls Map. Um, and this all started with an idea to be more civic minded after the uh, summer events of 2020, um, starting with George Floyd, looking at the health disparities, um, lots of different disparities that were taking place in our nation, and Black Girls Map wanting to do something about it. Um, and with that, we wanted to make sure, though, that we put people back at the center of the 2020 election, realizing that being more civic minded could help us make a change in those disparities that we were seeing happening across our nation. And so with our 150 plus volunteers, uh, we were able to answer that call. Um, our group, as I mentioned, made up of different people um, from different backgrounds um, with different thought processes. Um, being able to aim to engage with communities digitally and also in a way that had never been done before. And so the inspiration that our team kind of pulled from was also an opportunity for us to, to learn, to grow, and to reimagine what GIS um, could look like in this political climate. And so many of our team members were able to kind of have their own reflection time and their own growing time uh, being a part of this initiative. And through all of that, we were able to create some really cool stuff. 57 apps, 34 maps, 19 stories, eight dashboards and web app builders, 13 hub pages, two hub sites, and seven experience builders. On top of all of that, how we were able to kind of pull all those different uh, assets together was actually living in our People for the People site. So if you go to peopleforthepeople.org, um, you'll be able to kind of see all of this live and see it living in one place. That was one of our biggest goals is trying to bring all of that content, all that information that could help empower people to vote um, in one place that was easily accessible. And so that's built off of Airtable, which is our main database that we're housing all of the teams as different information. Um, this is data about candidates that we're running. Um, this is information about resources and election resources, dates, key dates, um, uh, voting rights, all of this information all in one database um, from Airtable. And then we were able to use Gatsby to kind of frame all of our um, UI and components and then be able to deploy that through Netlify. So jumping in, um, I want to pass this off to the design team. Uh, I think it's very important as we showcase the information products that we also talk about the design thinking of how we actually made all of this come together in a way that people could um, be attracted to and understand. And so I'll pass this off now to Caitlin. All right. Thanks so much, Whitney. Let's hop into design. And I'd like to explain a little bit of our thought process going in. So the people for the people visual direction was first and foremost influenced by the visual language of grassroots efforts. It was important to highlight the visual language we were seeing from the people. So I wanted to feature 
accessible mediums and common mediums that we are seeing, such as spray paint textures, foam brush textures, colors that are vibrant and just go beyond the dichotomy of blue and red. And lastly, I would mention a key part of our visual direction was just driven by imagery. The imagery we chose was very intentional and worked to center people more than anything else. A great example of this was the campaign that we were given and provided by our social media team, uh, which asked the question, who are you voting for? And that's in terms of not simply which candidate you are voting for, but who are the people in your life who are going to be affected by that vote? With that, I will hand it over to Dawit. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, so the idea from the sort of UI design uh, and UX design perspective was how can we take this brand uh, that Caitlin worked on and apply it to all of the People for the People projects that were actively being worked on. And so instead of linking people to an interactive story map over here and then a cool web app way over there, uh, we felt it would be a better experience for these projects to have a home and sort of live alongside other relevant projects and information. And so this eventually became peoplefortheople.org. Um, now, knowing that we needed to design and build, or knowing what we needed to design and build, we sort of jumped right into the research side of things. Um, so there are a lot of really great sort of grassroots election information websites out there, but none that we felt really checked all of the boxes uh, for what we were looking for. So we compiled a list of websites and infographics, articles, and anything else really that we felt um, did a great job of organizing this kind of information, uh, displaying it in an impactful way, and also that were just plain easy and enjoyable to use. So uh, we took that information and highlighted what we felt were some of the best things about each resource. Um, then we sort of put the pen to the paper and brainstormed by sketching a bunch of variations, but at a really low fidelity. So what you're seeing on screen right now um, are just some iPad sketches, basically wireframes, uh, to just overall highlight the structure of the site and how we wanted things to look um, and where we wanted them to be positioned. And so after sketching, we'd pick and choose the best ideas from each version, then take that back for another round of sketching, followed by another round of reviews. Um, and so we basically repeated this process a few times until we felt like our sketches and wireframes did a good job of checking all of those boxes. Um, and for those interested, this process is called uh, divergent and conversion thinking. So then after this, we kind of upped the fidelity by putting a few layers of paint uh, to sort of bring in that branding uh, that Caitlin spoke about. Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. Uh, but pretty soon after, we ran into a problem um, that we found with many other sites during our research. We felt that our site was organized well, but uh, there was no clear direction or incentive uh, to, to scroll or continue browsing. You know, like we have a lot of really great content that we want to show people, but the last thing we want to do is over uh, make them feel overwhelmed or unsure about where to start. And so we decided to think about the way someone like my mother, for example, would flow through the site. Uh, and with that in mind, we adjusted the design accordingly. So here's what that flow would look like. Um, first, we started with this carousel of images at the top. Uh, Caitlin sort of uh, went through those earlier. Uh, they were eye-catching in size uh, and color uh, and the messaging as well. And so uh, below that, we felt we should state who we are uh, and what we're trying to achieve, uh, our mission statement, which Whitney talked about. Um, and then after setting that context, we highlighted some of the key voting issues that um, would sort of link out to the great work that other folks on this team are doing. And then as you continue to scroll down, um, you can manually select your state and district to see who's running. You can get links about their campaign site and social media, uh, so you can continue your research on your own. Um, and you can see upcoming election dates and deadlines specific to your state. And then at this point, you know, we sort of gave you the, the who, what, when, where, and why, but we haven't really given you the how. How can we leave you with some action items? Um, so what we did was basically provide helpful links for how to vote, checking your registration status, uh, your voter registration status, and uh, a lot more. And all of that made this flow feel 
more relatable uh, and directed and almost guided. Um, so that's really what we wanted uh, rather than just sort of bombard you with information. Uh, and then throughout this process, it was really important for us to get feedback. Uh, so personally, I would sort of hallway test this with those around me to see how they use it. Um, did they have any difficulties or confusion? Um, and then also, our work was shared uh, from time to time with uh, other people on this team to ensure that the design direction that we came up with made sense uh, when extrapolated out to the projects that they were working on. And so with that in mind, I want to hand this over to Are to talk about how this all translates to um, the rest of the amazing work done by the people on this team. Um, thank you, Dawit and Caitlin. Um, as mentioned before, we have hundreds of volunteers who work on producing content for people for the people. We recognize finding information on the internet about voting issues, candidates who are running, or even learning how to vote is a pain point. Um, so our goal is to help people find credible voting information and resources. Part of our design challenges were to efficiently present information across multiple apps, visual, visualize key voting issues, um, making sure our design guidelines are carried through all of our pages and apps, and most importantly, that the information are accessible from any devices. Um, so working with StoryMap and Hub Teams, we created templates using our design guidelines that Caitlin established where our team members can then add in um, import, important stories, maps, and data. And with help from our dev team, we tied in the all, all, all the pages and apps to our main site. Um, the result of our collaboration is peopleforthepeople.org that now serves as an entry point to a robust voting resource that is easy to use and accessible for the people. And 2020 was just a starting point for us and for this site. Now we can continue to develop the site and get ready for future elections. And with that, let's take a deeper dive into some of our apps and the technology that was key to our collective effort. Thanks, Ade. So the first app that we'll be talking about is the Who is Running app. Um, and the motivation behind this app was um, to allow people to effortlessly filter, interact, and discover candidates running for Congress in the 2020 election. We aim to provide a user-friendly interface to use someone's location to find who's running in their district for House of Representatives or their state for Senate. To further enrich our database, we collected each candidate's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram profiles, if applicable, and their campaign websites. We thought this was important because we live in a very social media driven world and our candidates are often posting very relevant and important information on their accounts. We also felt that it was important to include the campaign website of each candidate to help our users inform their vote based on if a candidate's platform addressed certain key voting issues that we identified are important to them. We took it a step further by connecting in data about candidates' race, gender, and political party to start to unlock patterns across the nation. I did talk about the data collection portion of this application because the data was not readily available, so we had to make it available ourselves. And we did this by crowdsourcing the data throughout our whole team, um, and we used Airtable to do this. So here's an example of what our Airtable looks like. Um, we pretty much just, we, we had some, some falls along the way um, when it came to table schema. So that was something that we struggled with and had to adapt. But eventually it ended up being two different Airtables. One was for the House of Representative congressional districts, and then the other was for the Senate. And the Senate, as you can imagine, was a lot easier because there's only, you know, so many, and there's so many different uh, districts throughout the United States when it comes to uh, the House of Representatives. So here's an example of what this table looked like. Um, we pretty much used all of these amazing filtering capabilities and grouping capabilities, sorting, et cetera, that um, Airtable has. Um, and we pretty much just assigned people different chunks of this data. So, you know, I, I had a handful of volunteers that helped me 
uh, kind of do all of this. Um, and so some people would be assigned, you know, Alabama through California or something, and they would come in and we had the geographic data already in here. Um, so we have, you know, what district it is, what state it's in, um, the geoid, which is corresponds with uh, the state and the district that it's in. Um, and then we started to identify some important uh, attributes that came up along the way, including the date of the primary at the time the election was, uh, you know, didn't happen yet. So we had to keep track of all the different dates uh, so that we could help people get out there and vote. Uh, obviously, their name, their party was important. And we could use these little categorization fields where you could just, you know, pick which one. Um, and in this data, we are identifying Democrat, Republican, other, and independent. Um, and if I could go back, I would probably include a couple more uh, specific examples of those others. Um, and then we identified whether or not the person was the incumbent or the challenger. So we felt that was important to point out like what incumbents were running for re-election and who their challengers were. And then we uh, got to get into the fun stuff of finding campaign URLs and we used um, Ballotpedia a lot to for this kind of information, but we wanted to take their data a step further and include in uh, Twitter's, Instagram's, um, race, gender, things like that, and also uh, put it on a map and make it geographic. So we have their campaign URLs, their Twitter handles, their Instagram handles, so you can go straight and, and tweet at them or search for them on those, um, you know, social media platforms. And then we also included a URL to their Facebook, a URL to an image that we could use inside of the app. Um, so each candidate where it was applicable, when they had all of these things, we would fill it out and we went back and, you know, cross-checked it quality checked it several times and made sure all the information was correct. Um, we then started to um, collect data on whether or not they are a black indigenous person of color uh, or a woman, or this is uh, filtered so it's not showing everything. Um, so I'll actually turn those off. So, uh, you know, taking that race um, attribute and then whether or not they are a woman and then whether or not this district was a battleground or not so that we could feed that all into the map that you'll see. Um, so we cross-checked this information of whether they identified as a woman on you know what pronouns they used um, and then we cross-referenced their race and ethnicity uh, through you know searching on Google or uh, looking on their website. Um, there are plenty of lists out there of, you know, black senators, black representatives, Latin American, Native American, etc. So, um, and then I'll give you a, a sneak peek into the Senate table, kind of the same setup here. Um, it'll tell you the state, their name, campaign website, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc. We started to do this thing. Um, we didn't end up finishing it, but we were going to incorporate some of their campaign priorities, but it, it did seem like a daunting task. So we decided to put that on the backlog um, and we'll kind of address it in a different light for the next election. And then here you'll see instead of battleground and swing state, um, there's a lot of terminology that we had to kind of make sure that we were using all of the right lingo. Um, so for swing state, it's pretty much, you know, those really contentious areas that, um, you know, if, if it went one way or the other, it could really change the the power around in the United States. So, yeah, so I will go ahead and pass it off to Patrick to talk about uh, the back end development of this application. Thanks. Thanks, Summer. So now I want to take a closer look at the app. And the main feature of the app is actually the interactive map of candidates. And we wanted to really treat this a little differently, tying back into some of the things that the design team mentioned about the use of imagery and the use of breaking out of that 
red and blue dichotomy. And we also really wanted to push people to explore the map, either by entering the state that they live in or entering their address or using their current location. And then we can highlight the specific candidates in their area. And we also really use the map as a way to highlight the different battleground states. So you'll notice the the striped backgrounds on some states and on some congressional districts that actually represents battleground states and where there's a battleground district in a battleground state it ends up doubling up on that striped pattern indicating a definite like contentious area in the election and then the final features were also we're also filtering by different political parties so you can just filter by democrat and republican or just democrats can also filter based on gender or race. And these were all choices that we made in order to highlight these candidates and also to give a better idea of the makeup of the people who are going to be elected. So I want to go through some of the key pieces of what makes this happen. And the first piece is really a custom data processing script. So the data collection team flowed a lot of this information into Airtable. And then in order to actually get it onto the map, we needed to take that data from Airtable and combine it with feature services that we created for the congressional districts and the states. So we have a script that essentially takes uh, Airtable of candidates and actually maps it onto each of the states and determines things like the state abbreviations and the centroid of where the label is going to go for the candidates in the state and where they're going to be labeled in the district. And we actually page through and calculate all of that ahead of time for the app. And then we match all of that up when you go back onto the actual app. So this is a, a fairly long, complicated file, but you can see we actually fetch do things like fetching the boundaries and then we fetch the label points asking for the centroid of each state from the servers and then we match all that up and process it into the app and then the next step is actually once you get the once you get the um data into the application we actually need to create the mapping experience and that's a composite of several different layers so there's a custom base layer which is where you see a lot of the text labels and the outlines of the United States come in and then we overlay the actual state and congressional district boundaries on top of that. And the symbology of those use uh, SIM symbols, which is what allowed us to get both the alternating background. So we can do dashed borders and then we can also do that hashed fill for battleground states. So we actually use the SIM hatch fill and we can say, I wanna alternate uh, two different lines of two different colors. And that's what gives us that ability to do that hashed background. And the other thing is we looked at the battleground unique value. So there's a flag on each district on each state that indicates whether it's a battleground or not. And that allows us to key off of this state is a battleground, this state isn't, and, and deliver a different symbology for each of those. Now for the the actual candidate images and the house districts, this was a little more complicated because we knew we wanted to show an image for each of the candidates for Senate that we're running. And the reason we wanted to do that is we wanted to bring a bit more of a focus onto the candidates themselves and onto the people and really show that. And this wasn't really possible with anything that currently existed in the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. So we ended up going a route of actually creating a custom layer type, which rendered raw HTML over the map at a particular position. And then we actually filled that with the images. And this ended up being a pretty interesting project using the base layer view class and actually creating a subclass of that and attaching a custom, custom HTML. So you can see that we're formatting a lot of HTML here. We're adding registers for clicking on specific candidates. Um, implementing tool tips to handle a custom pop up ourselves. So a lot of this flow, the data flowed into that, but it let us lay out a really custom approach for how we wanted to draw the individual candidate images at each individual location. And it also allowed us to do things like in the case of Georgia, where there were initially 20 candidates for Senate, you can actually view all of them at this outer 
zoom level, but as you zoom out, we actually detect that you zoom out past a certain threshold and we begin to actually collapse that down. So it let us build a lot of really custom behavior and layouts into all of the individual into all of the individual layouts. And the, the next piece is really using layer effects. So a big piece of this is honing in on your specific state or your specific district. And when you do that, we actually highlight the outline of your particular state. So if we go back to Georgia, we actually can see that Georgia becomes highlighted relative to all of the other states. And we did a lot of work. There was a lot of work done with layer effects, which is a fairly new feature. So when we have a layer that's active or a district that's active, we can apply a particular filter where the state or district matches that identifier and give it different styles. So if a state falls outside that particular filter, we can make it more gray, we can reduce its opacity, but when a state's included in that filter, like Georgia in my previous example, we can actually make it brighter and saturate it more. And this allows us to really get some custom focus in the map for very specific areas, which I think has a really nice effect. So without totally hiding everything, you can still get a really good sense for everything that's happening. And then finally, a lot of the deep interactions between the map and the filter sidebar. So the ability to filter down really quickly by particular criteria, the ability to go not just to a particular state, but also to a particular address. So a user could search their own home address and immediately find the candidates at their address. They could use their current location if they didn't even want to type it in. And we would focus immediately on that user and that user's candidates. And a lot of that's actually powered by the URL bar. So we actually have a dedicated URL for every state and every district, and this is all handled as a part of the React application that's that's running under this. And there's communication between the map and that application. So when someone visits something like slash state slash CA, we actually can go in and look up what state you're in and optionally what district you're in and then call back various pieces of the map. So whenever that state ID changes or whenever that district ID changes, we can actually query the extent of that area. We can then set the map to that. We can set up click handlers for that area. And then we can actually apply the different effects. So whenever that state ID changes, we're gonna apply the state effect, which is that filter for handling all the grayscale effects, zooming to the lake, zooming to the state, zooming to the district. That all happens on the fly as the user actually changes those URLs. And this let us link from deeper parts of the who is running um, people for the people site into specific states or into specific districts, which turned out to be a really great, a great piece of this. So that's a bit of a deeper look at the who is running app. Um, from a technical perspective, some of the more interesting pieces of, of how it's built and put together. All right, now I'm going to pass it back to Whitney to talk about our next app. All right, well, thanks, Pat. I'm going to talk really quickly about our sentiment mapping um, application that P4T put out recently. Um, it consists of a word cloud. We're leveraging Experience Builder as well as Survey123 to capture those sentiments. Um, and then with um, some more development side of things using JSA API, uh, we're doing some really cool custom stuff that Jeff King is going to talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, just to note that this application currently um, is being showcased um, through the city of Chicago's um, virtual summit that just took place in 2021. All right, Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff King, uh, a developer uh, with professional services in Esri. Um, and I work from the St. Louis office. I helped uh, Whitney to build this experience builder um, sentiment map, uh, and I mainly worked on the uh, JavaScript side of it. So I'm just gonna dive in and show you guys kind of how it works. So if we come to experience builder here, you can see that this is the editing um, configurator for experience builder. If I go into the actual page, you can see that in order to get our custom code into here, we basically embedded straight HTML directly into here. So this was kind of a, a design 
consideration that we thought about for a little bit. We realized that currently in Experience Builder's uh, state, it's not very easy to um, configure or extend with custom code, at least directly through Portal. Um, but this gives us a way that we can at least put raw HTML and embed it directly into Experience Builder apps. So our thought was to basically build a custom uh, HTML experience and stick it directly in here, just like this. So that's exactly how the word cloud is being, is being shown through that embedded piece. Now, if we look at the actual word cloud in action, we notice a few things, right? We notice that as we mouse over things, it hovers and shows the color, which is pretty neat. Um, if we click on a word, it will show us a pop-up uh, with information about what that state is feeling. So California feels unsettled, uh, is, is unsettling about this. Um, and it gives us a little bit of extra info from the Server 123 form that people filled out along with some race distribution information in the pop-up. So as I click on different words, you can notice that sometimes the words over here actually update, right? So the word cloud is actually responsive to the extent that you're looking. So as I pan around, you can see that the some of the words disappear. Um, as I zoom in here into St. Louis, you can see that now a lot of the words have filtered down to only the ones that are being viewed in, uh, in this space. So if I click on hopeful, you can see that it zooms directly to the extent of whatever state I picked. You can notice that it actually zoomed me to California. And that's because hopeful actually had responses from multiple states. California is one of them. However, hopeful also had responses in Missouri and Massachusetts as well. So the pop-up is smart enough to move on between features. Another thing to note is that if there are multiple features within a single state, it displays the multiple responses directly in the pop-up here as a list. So we have three responses in California. Missouri only has one and Massachusetts has one. So that's kind of how the word cloud is working. As I pan around, it filters it. If I click on a word, it actually filters out the, the correct state that it needs to filter out and shows the information. So now, if I dive into the code of this, you can see a little bit of how it's working. So let's first take a look at the structure of this. So you might notice that it's all in one HTML file, and that's um, due to the constraints that I mentioned earlier about how in Experience Builder right now, we can only make it completely custom um, through embedding raw HTML. So that's where we have to stick this all into a single HTML file. Um, it's not the cleanest, but um, it's probably the best way to get this to work um, in Experience Builder right now within Portal. So in order to get all of this working, we need two APIs driving, main, uh, driving most of this. We need D3 for the actual word cloud generation, uh, along with D3 cloud. Um, and then we have the ArcGIS JS API for handling all the mapping components. So as I scroll down here, you can see that at the top of the page, we have a section blocked off and denoted as an area for configuration. The idea was that we could make this and make it easy for anybody to take and configure for themselves for any different type of sentiment mapping that they want to try. Um, in this case, we mapped the sentiment of race relations in, in the US, but you could extend this to mapping all types of sentiments for various types of boundaries. We used states, um, but you could even you know, do this at the county level or, or census block level um, if you wanted to. So that's why we have it configure, configurable to choose your survey layer name, your boundary layer name, um, along with your web map ID. So depending on which web map ID that you put in here, it drives what you need to put into your boundary layer and survey layer name. You need to put in your fields as well. Um, 
coming from your survey feature uh, or your survey service um, to know, you know, what your question field is and, and where you're going to get your descriptions from. And since we're using state, our boundary name field is going to be state, but this could be different if you're using a different boundary, um, a boundary layer. A cool thing about this is that the pop-up content is actually completely configurable as well. So you'll notice here that I have this configured using media infos. Media infos is a standard that um, is used in the JS API. So if you look up the documentation on pop-up content in the JS API docs, you'll notice that um, you can look for media infos and other infos that you can stick directly in a pop-up content and you can put those JSON objects directly here to uh, configure your pop-up how you need to. So this is the starting place for the pop-up, but later on it also injects the information about um, the responses from the survey into this as well. But this is how the actual race distribution um, pie chart is being placed into the pop-up content. The word cloud color um, and fonts are also configurable. So I don't have a whole lot of time to dive, you know, super deep into the code. So first, I just kind of want to show you how I made this configuration even easier for people that don't want to dive into code. So for somebody that's extremely intimidated by this, even coming into here and changing some of this around might look extremely daunting to some people. That's why I decided to make um, a React app entirely to configure the app. So all those same configurations that you saw before, web map ID, app ID if you need it to be behind secured services, um, survey layer name, all of this is configurable directly here. And there's even a color picker for your word cloud colors. You'll notice that as I change this around, it actually changes the copyable HTML here on the right. So as I change this color, you can see the word cloud color here changing. If I change the pop-up content, you can see it changing directly there as well. So it's a little bit easier to configure if you're not familiar with code. It just gives you some inputs to input directly into. You still have to be a little bit familiar, obviously, with services and, um, and um, how our services work in order to know, you know, where you're getting your question field, your description field, and, and your web map ID. So once you configure this, it's as easy as just copying this HTML, going to your Experience Builder app, clicking on the embed piece, and just pasting it directly there. And once that's done, you can save your app and basically deploy it and it's ready to go. Um, one thing to keep in mind though is that these embedded pieces in Experience Builder are isolated from the rest of the Experience Builder app. So that's one limitation is that, you know, this embedded piece cannot interact with this header here or these buttons down here. Um, they're, they're simply isolated, disconnected pieces. Um, but hopefully something like this um, will open up you know, people's minds for more types of sentiment mapping. Um, maybe this lets people get into sentiment mapping who were, who were intimidated by it before. Um, and I hope you all liked this little dive into the, uh, into the code behind it. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you. Thanks, Jeff uh, King, for giving us the awesome breakdown of the sentiment map. I'm now going to pass it off to another Jeff on our team, uh, Jeffrey Scamrazi, as he's going to talk through our Twitter sentiment analysis app, uh, him and Manushi. All right. Thank you, Whitney. Um, so what I'm going to do very quickly is describe some of the ETL routines that we use to move Twitter uh, data into ArcGIS Online. And then I will hand it off to Manushi, who will describe all the really interesting work that went into um, analyzing that data. So let me share my screen. All right, so here is the operation dashboard uh, that we created for the People for the People project. And the idea of this tool was we wanted people to say, for instance, um, I live in Virginia, and I was particularly interested in District 11, right? So I could look at the candidates who were running and 
get a feel for some of the things they were saying, the tone they were using. And in my mind, a lot of what um, could inform a particular voter isn't necessarily a political sort of um, angle or some sort of political uh, avenue. Uh, I think looking at people as humans, right? And Twitter's kind of a, a great thing for that because people describe themselves. This is who I am, right? I am I am a mother um, or I am a, a veteran or, or, or something like this, right? Um, and moving Twitter data um, into Arctic Line is actually pretty trivial. Um, what we were doing was part of the team was collecting information in Airtable. And we would essentially take that Airtable information and map it into a JSON. And essentially, we would put in some hosted feature layer. In this case, it was a hosted feature table. And all we would do is make our requests. And uh, using the Tweepy library, um, Tweepy is a really nice uh, interface to Twitter because we were using a public account. And there are rate limits. And the beauty of the cursor that Tweepy implements means that for the 900 distinct um, Twitter handles that we were looking at, um, you essentially just run past that limit very quickly, right? So for our 900 distinct users, um, I think it would take a little over two and a half hours to run. But the beauty is that we didn't have to sort of write much logic into our script. It just sat there, waited for the next window, and took the next user um, off of the stack and began processing them. Um, as far as the ArcGIS um, API, uh, world is concerned. Not much really to report here, um, but if you're not familiar with the GeoAccessor, this namespace to a pandas data frame, uh, it is the absolute truth, right? Um, we're not doing too much with it in this code. We're mostly using it for the convenience of managing date time objects. And when we want to add or delete something, the ability to take our data frame, call the GeoAccessor, and then dump that table into something that Esri is comfortable um, pushing into um, uh, the REST API. It, it was it was a really good thing. So that is really it. Um, and now I will turn it over to Manushi, who is going to tell you about all the really uh, interesting stuff. Let's take a look at this app that Jeffrey just showed. Here, as we see, we have the tweets. Each tweet individually fetched for the particular state selected here, the particular district, if, if a particular district has been selected. We then made time charts, temporal charts based on uh, tweets by district as well as party as accumulated over time. And this section that we see right here for all the, the text analysis, the sentiment analysis that we've done, I'll show you this, the script that went into putting it together. You can, you can fetch it yourself by clicking on this uh, uh, icon right here and, and clicking on the NLP analysis uh, bit. We start out by reading this particular item or feature layer in that Jeffrey showed us was put together by scraping and consistently collecting all the tweets over time. Having read it as a uh, particular table using the RGS API for Python, we then take a quick look at this table to ensure it's in the format with the fields of our interest. We observe here that while the entire state name has been uh, extracted for these particular tweets, we still perform a step of due diligence and ensure that for any tweet, if at all, the state abbreviation is extracted as opposed to the state name, then that automatically is converted to the state name after running this particular method right here. This ensures that all our state names are uniform, which is something we'll see shortly why it's useful. As a first step to our analysis, we extract mentions for these tweets. Mentions can be thought of as institutions, organizations, or people that are tagged or called out in the tweet text. We extract them using this particular regular expression right here. We proceed then to calculate sentiment scores for the tweets. While there are several Python libraries and packages that help us with sentiment analysis, we chose to go ahead with Vader sentiment because it gives us a score for negativity, neutrality, positivity, and a general compound uh, cumulative score for each tweet text. 
This compound or cumulative score is then extracted in a new column called sentiment score and we then use the matplotlib plotting library to plot it as a histogram. As we see right here, most of the tweets are neutral in score and then are, are more positive than negative uh, for the other tweets. We follow this step by extracting tokens for each tweet. Tokens are like individual words, individual pieces or terms in our tweet. So as we see right here, hope voters of Bihar are all individual tokens or words from the tweet text. We then eliminate stop words from all of these tokens. Stop words are uh, words that don't add semantic meaning to the tweet text but are still needed for sen sentence construction. So they can be thought of as articles such as A, D, and which don't really add much value uh, to, to the particular tweet text. We eliminate uh, the commonly used stop words in the English language and we also add character com uh, combinations such as HTT HTTP and HTTPS. This ensures that those particular terms are also not flagged as, as frequently used terms in, in our list of tokens. So as we see here, we've not only extracted a particular list or array of tokens, that is individual words of the, and terms of the, sen of the tweet text and sentence, we've also, we've also extracted clean tokens, that is tokens without those stop words. Now we compute stats for each state. So the reason we initially ensured that state abbreviations was converted to state names was in the interest of uniformity and so, so as to ensure that no particular tweet was left out because of that discrepancy. And we then uh, aggregate them by getting an average of the sentiment score as well as a list of all the mentions, all the hashtags and all the clean tokens. This helps us to then find the most frequently occurring mention and hashtag for each state. So for each state, we now have extracted using that entire list of all mentions and hashtags, the most frequent one. The most frequent mention tells us which organization or institution or person is called out the most uh, by uh, people tweeting from a particular state. And the most common hashtag tells us which issue or which topic people are most concerned about or are tweeting the most about. We then proceed to get the most frequently used words or topics or terms for each state. We then conclude by uh, accumulating all these statistics in a particular table that is the clean tokens, the most frequent mention, hashtag and the most uh, frequent words along with the frequency of how many times that that word was mentioned in in all the tweets and then store and save this particular data this particular table as a csv file to rgs online which then was fed as input to this particular dashboard that we see right here thanks manushi all right everyone so i'm going to talk a little bit about how we began to communicate our technology and the data that we had for people for the people the first thing I want to point out is that we had a lot of really incredible data visualization, data analysis, data sourcing, and we needed to find a way to make it accessible. And we did that through using a combination of two forward facing Esri apps. The first was ArcGIS Story Maps, and the second was ArcGIS Hub. So, what you see right now on my screen is a few screen grabs of how we used the combination of Hub and Story Maps, right? So, the base site of this is ArcGIS Hub. And you can see that each hub site has a section that says stories that bring us together. And each of these uh, stories that bring us together sections uh, brought, brought to the forefront stories using ArcGIS story maps that communicated our information in an accessible, visually appealing and interactive way, right? And, and so this worked for us for a couple of reasons. The first reason was, is it allowed our user to feel connected to our content, to the people, to the places um, and to the information that we were uh, trying to convey, uh, because when you use story maps, you get to integrate text, multimedia, uh, maps, and place-based data to form this really uh, well-rounded narrative that makes it pretty easy for a user uh, to see themselves in, meaning they can go around and click on the map and see, you know, what particular topic might be relevant to their area or their loved one's area. And so story maps were one of the first steps uh, that we took to kind of humanize and recenter our data back on the people. 
So instead of just focusing on the data, the numbers, um, the, the visualizations, we wanted to make sure that we were, as always, putting people, real people, at the center of everything we did. And so we did this through, through ArcGIS story maps and presenting these forward facing. Uh, one of the key features of ArcGIS story maps that made it really easy for us to use them was the custom theme builder, which allowed us to integrate our visual language instantaneously. So we built out a few different themes and made some story templates. And then all of a sudden we were able to replicate this uh, at a wide scale so that we had consistent visual branding, visual identity, and that we had this look and feel that was very much uh, people for the people. So that everybody who stumbled into one of our stories or was navigating through our hub sites to a story or even you know, on our main web frame, uh, web page, uh, they were, when they stumbled upon a story, it didn't look or feel like anything different. It was just people for the people. And we kept our visual guidelines really well using the ArcGIS Story Maps theme builder. The second reason that we use Story Maps here, uh, aside from like the, the obvious communication um, benefits, uh, was the fact that Story Maps offers a single builder that's really flexible. So what you're looking at right now is the back end of a story that we published around the disenfranchisement of transgender voters. Uh, but what's what's up on your screen is what we're calling what we call the block palette. And so the block palette allows uh, folks to use and and implement uh, multimedia. So your your videos, your images, your audio, and then also maps in new and integrative ways. Plus that combined with story maps immersive blocks made it really easy for us to create really stunning kind of standalone products that had all of what we needed it to have uh, in combination with our incredible place-based data and analysis that our teams had been doing. And the, the, the highlight of this was that it allowed us to do it without like writing even one line of code um, for ArcGIS story maps, which was really great because, you know, when we had so many people volunteer. Not everybody had GIS experience. Not everybody had uh, developer experience. Not everybody was familiar with different coding languages. And so when we were looking to create products uh, that were forward facing, we knew we needed to have um, an app that allowed us to, to work with all different levels of GIS experience. And so we used ArcGIS Story Maps because we could create these gorgeous and compelling information products with, with no coding at all and a fairly accessible and really low entry point in terms of technical ability. And that's not to say that we didn't have incredibly technical folks, we did, but it allowed us to bring in people who wanted to become involved with people for the people who were really connected to the issues, who wanted to um, participate and contribute and brought them in in a really important way and, and gave them the opportunity to, to, to kind of buy in to people for the people beyond just the mission and like the ethos of of what we created and actually work hands on to create some of the products that we put out to the public. Right. So the single flexible builder, the emphasis that you didn't need to be a developer or could code to create them really put story maps uh, at the forefront of, of products we were using. And we created, uh, I believe, over 25 of them. Right. And they're embedded in our hub site. They're embedded in our website. There are a few standalone stories. Uh, there's also stories that we use as instructional vehicles. So when we created some of our custom apps, like the ones that were talked about earlier, um, these stories kind of wrapped around them and walked the user through how to best navigate those apps, um, some of the best practices for them, and essentially allowed us to communicate essential information in addition to just the, the data product, the, the app that we had also created, uh, which was pretty huge for us. Uh, so right now you're taking a look at one of the stories that we created for People for the People, and this one takes a look at health disparities in the United States. And I just want to take you through kind of, you know, this is our, our darker People for the People theme. We have our consistent branding over here. You can see we have multimedia that's floated uh, with text, and then we can incorporate different graphs, uh, different types of interactive information. Uh, and so this is what I mean with when I, when I say that this is really kind of a, a multi-sensory experience, a, a interactive, immersive experience that allows the user to really resonate with the information that's being conveyed, because I could go and click on this map instantly and understand more about um, the, the information that was being presented as it is in, in my, local, my local area. So I believe this is uh, life expectancy, right? So I could go and see kind of what's going on in the counties near, near where I live. Um, 
and immediately I feel more connected. And between the information that's presented in this map and my, my local knowledge, I can maybe infer more about the, the local populations um, and how policy may be impacting them and then also contributing to, to life expectancy. And so before I get too into the weeds, I, I do wanna hand it over to Sam, my colleague Sam. She's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the hub site and why we use this as the vehicle for our stories and our other information products. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to you, Sam. Hello, I'm Sam Hunter, a UI UX designer on the ArcGIS Hub and Enterprise Sites products. I'll talk a bit about how we built the key voting issues and toolkit pages using ArcGIS Hub Premium. While there was a different purpose for each, on the left you can see the key voting issues. Leadership determined a list of 13 topics to focus on and small groups were assembled to source and create content for each of them. Then I worked with others to get all these pages set up. On the right you can see the election toolkit this page was inspired by Esri's Racial Equity Hub um, with a goal to share not only story maps and apps, but also key data sets that um, the larger GIS field could use for their own equity efforts surrounding U.S. elections. If you aren't familiar with the Hub app, I recommend you check out our product site. Specifically, the gallery and template pages have a lot of great examples of how others are using it. You can explore it like any other site, browse linked pages, use search, follow things you care about, explore data sets, annotate your own maps, and more, all from Hub. So getting to Hub is easy. If you have access to essential apps and an ArcGIS online account, you probably already have Hub Basic. I recommend you use the app switcher to get to Hub. Once you do, you'll land on your org's Hub overview where you can create and manage your sites or initiatives. The differences of these are listed on our product page. After you create a new site, you'll land in our layout editor. The side panel has many options, which I recommend you test out. For the people for the people site, I knew we needed to first convert the default site to the proper branding and dark theme. Then since the site was technically going to be a page inside of their main site, I turned off most of Hub's native navigation controls. So then the bulk of my efforts were editing the layouts themselves. Here's a rundown of the key things in the interface to be aware of. The navigation drop-downs at the top help you switch between sites or navigate your current project. On the right, there are save and publish options. Within the editor itself, which is drag and drop, you can see which cards are used and their relevant controls. Apart from the text card, all cards and settings are controlled from the side panel. Switch to the second tab to manage sharing, just like any other item in ArcGIS Online. For example, while we were developing these pages, we had them shared to the org and then we switch them to public when we were ready to launch. So now we're going to do a quick rundown of the types of cards available in Hub, starting with our primary layout cards. Rows contain all other cards, so you'll start with those first. For the bulk of the KVI, KVI layouts, we use rows to highlight each section, with spacer cards at the top and bottom to add breathing room. Since Hub has a base font size of 14 pixels, I used the Edit and HTML option on all the text cards to increase font sizes that better match the people for the people look and feel. Next, we have cards that set Hub apart from your standard free site editor, since they're powered by Hub or ArcGIS online content. Once you place a card, you use an item picker to search for content from your org, content you've created, or content that is available publicly, such as Esri Tapestry data. These cards are a great way to feature GIS content. You can highlight collections of items you want visitors to search, share the newest or most popular content with a dynamic gallery card, or set that dynamic card to manual if you want to curate the content like we did on the KVI pages. Apart from linking to your content, you can also display stats, charts, maps, or other GIS applications directly in your hub site. If items get edited, they will remain in sync, so visitors always have the most recent content. You can also include external content. For example, each KVI page included a social media card so we could show relevant authoritative Twitter feeds related to each topic. Finally, we have collaboration cards. We use the follow card on the KVIs so anyone who is interested could create their own ArcGIS online account in the community organization, which is a premium only feature. And then they would be added to a special group called community. Once they are followers, members of a site's core team can message them or share content with them. Each KVI page had the same main sections, a hero image, stories, a quote, an app map gallery to showcase the team's amazing GIS work, social feeds, 
a custom timeline powered by a table that was embedded into the page using an iframe card, and finally our prompt to become a follower. Near the end, a large QA effort went underway, making sure images were not only on brand, but free to use and properly compressed, sources of external content were cited or linked to, a grammar, language, and tone check was also done by my teammate Amanda to make sure the content was presented in a way that matched the vision and goals of People for the People. No matter what app you use, always keep in mind accessibility and mobile responsiveness. While Hub starts off being WCAG 2.0 compliant, it's up to you to maintain that once you begin to customize things. Same for mobile. Make sure you test the layout in different window sizes or use our Hide on Mobile toggle that is in certain cards, if your performance or layout is poor. Finally, although not used in this product, I wanted to mention a beneficial feature of Hub is our built-in navigation, header, and search, especially if you plan to showcase a lot of data that users might need to search, explore, or download. These features are mobile-friendly, easy to brand, and help to create a rich Hub experience. All right, well, thank you, Samantha, and thank you to all of you who were tuning in um, to be able to hear about our process and the work that we were able to accomplish um, in 2020. And so with that, I just want to put up on the screen uh, how you guys can follow us and follow the rest of our work, um, as well as even reach out for questions. Our team is more than happy to answer those. And so on behalf of Black Girls Map, as one of the co-founders, along with Raina Kamal, we just want to say thank you so much. And thank you to our P4TP team um, for just doing amazing work and answering that call to action. All righty. Well, everyone, take care. Bye-bye.